Before we start this episode, I want to say a big thank you to our partner, Hoya Vision Care Canada. Hoya Vision Care Canada and the 2020 podcast are partnering on a series of four interviews on the topic of myopia management. This discussion is the first in that series. I hope you enjoyed this conversation, but make sure you tune back in for the rest of the series that we'll be releasing over the next few months. Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the 2020 Podcast, Canada's number one optometry podcast. I am your host, Dr. Harbir Sayan. Thank you so much for joining me here today. As you can see here is somewhere a little bit different. I am in my own clinic here. We're at Clarity Eye Care with my very good friend, Dr. Gary Matter. And Dr. Matter is a graduate of the New England College of Optometry, Go Neco, in 2012. And we've been friends since Neco and been following each other's journeys here back in BC. Gary is also a partner at Maple Ridge Eye Care here in BC and a father of three. We have so many things in common. Um, before we go too deep into the episode, I want to say thank you to Hoya Vision Canada for supporting this podcast and supporting the 2020 podcast as a whole. Now, we are going to talk about myopia management, and we're going to have a series of conversations about myopia management, this one being the first in this series of three or four conversations. And I wanted to have this conversation with Gary as we are going to be talking about how do we get started in myopia management? What does it look like to get started? What are kind of the early stages of that? Um, also, you know, beyond myopia management, how do we kind of grow our single vision prescription category versus, you know, just simply providing simply single vision glasses? How can we add uh, other benefits and advanced lens types uh, for those patients in that category? So without going too far into the podcast, Gary, thank you so much for being here, man. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. It's nice to... Uh to be in your office and be surrounded by such greatness. And I appreciate the, <laughs> the opportunity. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Gary. Um, also, you know what, Gary, we were just saying before we went on, like, uh, you know, the fact that you're not so present on social media and that kind of thing. And I thought, I mean, you said it yourself. I think that's actually a really valuable thing to bring to this podcast. Uh, a lot of times, yes, we look for guests that maybe have an online presence and can kind of spread the word a little bit. But when we're talking about something like this, this is very practical, tangible, clinical type of conversation. We don't need just somebody who has an online presence. We need somebody who has that personal uh, presence in a clinic and, and understands what it actually takes. You're a partner in a busy clinic. Uh, you oversee multiple doctors and staff and all of that kind of thing. So you're bringing crazy amounts of value in that sense. And just like we also said, just because it's not on social media doesn't mean it's not real, right? In fact, it's the other way around a lot of the times. The people who are not on social media often are the ones that are actually working and the ones on social media are usually <laughs> the ones just taking pictures and going places so all right let's get into this a little bit uh tell me about your journey venturing into myopia management how long has that been roughly how did you get into it it's a great question harbir i think the earliest introduction was most likely about eight years ago Okay. So it was actually sort of a slow organic change. I believe it was Zeiss. Okay. Zeiss had the myovision lenses That's a right. long time ago. And I had almost forgotten about them because we had used them on occasion when, when the opportunity presented itself. Uh, so we actually had several dozen patients, uh, children who were in those lenses for mm. many, many years. And it's not until I think three or four years ago, Hoya and the MyoVision and some of the Myo Cooper Vision, MyoSmart right. and the uh, Cooper MySight contacts have been a viable option with a lot of right. research behind them. Yep. So it was actually a, a slow organic growth from you know eight years ago. That's a pretty long time. Uh, that's longer than uh, for me and most other practitioners who are in the myopia management space. Um, you know, I just did my presentation at the BCDO this past weekend. Um, we just had our conference here in Vancouver, which was it was great as always. Um, but, you know, after that, I had a couple of people come up and, you know, a little bit docs that are a little bit older than us and, and come in and tell me that they've actually been practicing myopia management for decades. Yeah. And it's only yeah. recently that it's really become something that people uh, are, are digging into and, and maybe putting value on now. Uh, because we have more research behind some of these products. Um, myself, I kind of dabbled in atropine for five, six years before, again, 
the MySide and the and the, the MyoSmart and all these things became available to us. So right now, what are you doing in your practice for myopia management? What types of treatment options are you providing? Great question, Harbir. So I mentioned, we both mentioned the increase in research, the validity behind doing some of these things. Uh, I think that's what has really interested more practitioners in getting into it. Yep. Um, so as we all know, there's, you know, the four main types of treatments. We do actually offer all four options, uh, both the atropine, the glasses lenses, the contact lenses, as well as the orthokeratology. Gotcha. So you offer all four in the office. Um, so if a pay, so for me, for example, we do three out of those, the uh, spectacle lenses, soft contacts and, and atropine. Yeah. So if somebody, after I've presented all four, options to the patient and the parent if they decide they want to go ortho k i refer out for that but in your case would you do that yourself or would you pass that on to another od within the office what does that look like well it hasn't happened in practice yet so it's just a theory right okay, now I gotcha. um, if that choice is made that ortho keratology is going to be the best option for that child more than likely it would probably be myself i do um, have some additional training in rgp and heart lenses that okay. we do utilize in office um, it also requires a topographer and generally, uh, is recommended for orthokeratology with myopia management, I believe to have the axial length measurement as well. So you can kind of better measure that. Yep. Otherwise it's a little bit challenging. Absolutely. So we do have that technology available to us. Good. Um, but so far nobody's taken us up on it. Okay. So, but you're, you're trained in it and you have the technology available to, to, to do it. So, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about the axial length. I'll keep that for a little bit later. Can I ask your um, feelings on if that's necessary or what stage of the process? But tell me a bit more about um, sort of how do you then, the three that you do regularly, the spectacle lenses, the soft contacts, and the atropine, what's your split as far as patient uh, uptake on those three? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm sure every demographic and area will be a little bit different. And mm -hmm. each practitioner is probably more comfortable with one or the other. Ultimately, you know, it's it's a decision between the practitioner, the parents, and of course, the child. Uh, so what's going to work the best for them. We do have quite a few active children. And um, I find myself recommending contact lenses highly. Mm. Uh, the glasses lenses have probably been the secondary route. Um, much simpler, everybody sort of understands glasses. It's just a new technology and new treatment lens for them. Right. Yeah. Something, um, uh, we're gonna get back into the treatment options and that thing again, but something that I, I wanted to mention right off the top, um, you know, big part of this is um, we wanna try to increase the awareness and the comfort level for ECPs to, mm -hmm. to kind of lean into myopia management. Yeah. And one of the things that I suggest is that we need to look at myopia differently. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us look at myopia as a refractive condition, yeah. uh, which it is, but it's not. And, but it is more than that. And I say we need to look at it as a as an actual ocular disease because of the potential long term impacts on ocular health and so on. Yeah. A, do you agree? You can disagree with me on air. It's fine. And then B, you know, tell me why switching our mindset to that kind of thing will be important in the long term. It is totally, I, I am in agreement, Harbier. I think if we don't look at it as a disease, we won't be looking at it to treat. And this is absolutely something that we can now treat in the sense that we are improving the hmm. outcome for a child. So in that way, yes, uh, I would agree with you 100% that we should look at it uh, as a d disease. Yeah, I think I agree with you again. And, and as far as like myopia, uh, treatment goes, I know it's a stretch, but I'll, I'll often make that analogy to like glaucoma, right? Mm -hmm. We don't just say, oh, your IOP is high. Let's just see what happens. Uh, you know, or, and we don't also just say, here's your, you know, your prostaglandin analog. See you later. We, yeah. we have to do all the testing and the measuring and have people come back over and over. And I think that's similar in, in how we have to start to look at uh, myopia management. So let's go back to, um, we have the patient in the exam room. Mm -hmm. What type of questions are you asking the parent to help them make that choice between those options? Well, first we have to identify whether this child is at risk for uh, you know, developing progressive myopia. So we do have sort of a, a checklist in the office as far as their risk factors. Um, but usually it centers around their age, 
as well as their activity level. Hmm. Somebody who is very active might have a harder time with atropine, with the light sensitivity, um, you know, outside playing baseball. Um, so I would say that's probably the, the, the first starting point is their activity, activity level. level. Yeah. Um, how about um, beyond that, like, do, do you get pushback from parents or patients about like uh, aversion to eye drops or do parents um, say that maybe they feel like their kid's not old enough for contacts? Like where, where would you say are some of those sort of uh, hesitations in those options? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Not everybody uh, or their child wants to be taking an eye drop. Um, so there has been some pushback, but generally for the younger ones with that early onset myopia is where we tend to see that recommendation to initiate atropine therapy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes our recommendations and encouragement outweigh that and ultimately that is the best decision for them at a young age. Yeah. And something we were talking about earlier um, offline, but also Again, sorry, I'm, I'm referring back to my presentation multiple times. I apologize. I'm not trying to shamelessly plug my, my it's called the myopia startup. So if you see it, please look, sign up for it next time you're at a conference. I'm not just trying to shamelessly plug myself here, but it's because it just happened two days ago. It's very fresh in my mind. And he knows what he's talking about. I appreciate that's very kind, Gary. Um, so uh, the reason I keep referring to that is because I just had that presentation a couple of days ago. So fresh in my mind. But I asked the audience in that presentation, there's a question, and we're going through this conversation with the parent and the patient, like, what option is going to be best for you? Activity yeah. level, like you said, comfort level with different treatment options and so on. What's the golden question that a parent is most likely going to ask the doctor? What's up, guys? I just wanted to take a minute to thank our partner for this episode, Hoya Vision Canada. Are you searching for a game-changing solution in myopia management? Well, look no further. Introducing the new MyoSmart Chameleon Photochromic Lenses, taking eyewear to the next level by offering a two-in-one solution. These lenses combine clinically proven myopia management, UV protection, and enhance comfort and vision performance in intense sunlight. MyoSmart Chameleon lenses provide the perfect balance between convenience and effectiveness, allowing children to move seamlessly from indoors to outdoors, experiencing the convenience and comfort of photochromic lenses while their myopia management remains uninterrupted. These lenses are suitable for any myopic child, but they are particularly beneficial to children who are light sensitive or, of course, children who are also using atropine as part of their myopia management solution. With a patented photochromic film technology, MyoSmart Chameleon lenses maintain the outstanding performance of the DIMS technology that has been clinically proven to offer sustained myopia control effect over a six-year study while they rapidly adapt to sunlight, providing optimal vision in intense sunlight and quickly fading back to clear indoors. We all understand how important outdoor time is for myopia management and that children are active and always on the go. This is why the MyoSmart Chameleon lenses are designed with their lifestyle in mind. They offer the perfect combination of myopia management, UV protection, and comfort, allowing children to enjoy their favorite activities both inside and out. Experience the future of eye care and reach out to your Hoya representative today or go to www.hoyavision.ca to learn more. And now back to our episode. And that is, what would you recommend if this was your child yeah. now gary is a father of three as am i now and what were you telling me about being a dad and how that impacts your decision making there knowing what a parent is thinking and experiencing and worrying about for their child is easy to relate to in, in those situations i think talking to parents that are already myopic is generally an easier conversation sure. because they yeah. understand the potential future problems that their child might encounter mm. as a myo. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it gives you that level of empathy. Now, not to take away from, so, you know, anybody listening or watching who doesn't have kids, you know, it's perfectly okay, but uh, it does give you that le level of empathy. I think that perhaps yeah. you wouldn't have had, I know for myself, for sure, if, if I had, six plus years ago, somebody came in and, and I would say, well, you know, I yeah. started thinking about my nieces and nephews, perhaps, and kind of try to create that empathy. But certainly yeah. it helps you see that from a different perspective. But and for those of you out there who, you know, um, I, I would recommend, actually, I preemptively say it now, mm -hmm. after a few years of doing this, mm -hmm. I preemptively will say, 
uh, if this was my kid, this is what I would do. And, and I'm not doing it just to like push them out of the room and make a sale. Yeah. But I know that parents are looking for that extra little piece of encouragement. Right? Would you agree? It's a common question that we get. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Everybody wants to, to know what they would do in that situation. And, and that becomes part of our, instead of having, you know, 100 questions, we, we preempt. Which yeah, ones we I feel like you cut to. out like half the questions yeah. just by making that one statement. But yeah. it, people ask us these things all the time. Like, would you get LASIK? Yeah. Would you wear this lens? Yeah. Right. They ask you that anyway. That's so, a good corollary, actually. Yeah. Where so, would you go for LASIK? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it, it's common. They want our opinion and our perspective. We are the the trained professional in front of them, of course. And But being a parent also gives you that extra little um, sort of level of empathy and advantage even. Um, so let's go to if we're pick, talking about spectacle lenses. OK, so um, we do a, a fair bit of MyoSmart here in the office. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about you're writing a prescription and what kind of an information are you going to give to the parent and the patient to sort of prep them? And then what happens after the, when you walk out of the exam room, like the handoff situation to the optician and things like that? Mm -hmm. That's crucial. Um, we have trained all of our opticians, not just one. We have have a large team and unfortunately mm. we haven't been able to implement a champion or just you know one go-to person for that myopia management. Um, so we have actually trained our whole staff to be aware of these types of lenses and to be able to talk about them. You know, just like other progressive lenses or other lens modalities, the opticians are the experts. Mm. Um, so it's just one more lens in their repertoire. Um, yes, the recommendation is going to be made in the office, you know, by the optometrist. Uh, the lens technology is introduced. I think it's important with this totally new and brand new concept to them. Uh, that that technology is briefly discussed, mm. but it is handed over to one of our opticians. Gotcha. So you do mention a little bit of how about, the, how about how the lens works in the exam room? Probably not specifically. Okay. Uh, it would be towards the myopia management and myopia control goal, less about the optics. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. <clears throat> That's part of what we have to kind of figure out in yeah. the exam room is how to streamline that conversation. Personally, everybody's going to have, you know, their own spiel or flow that sort of works for them. Got it. Yeah. And then when you bring the patient out, you hand them over to the optician and all of the opticians are trained on that lens and are comfortable, well-versed and all of that. Um, and then they would show them like, or, or they would do the proper ex explanation of exactly how that lens works. We actually created a presentation uh, that we can oh, pull nice. up on our computers uh, that sort of brings them through the flow of the problem, myopia, its potential repercussions, how to treat it, and then specifically the different treatments and how they work. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. very good. Is that uh, just for like us, me included, um, what type of a uh, platform is that like a PDF or is that a, a present PowerPoint presentation or? I think it's both. We okay. created it in PowerPoint. Okay, okay. I believe we created a PDF as well. So that is uneditable. Good. Yeah. So you just kind of, uh, the, or the optician would go through the slides, educate the parent and the patient right there. That's, that's actually good. Yeah. It's visual. accessible at, at, on, on our server at all of the terminals. So okay. they can just sort of share their screen if they have specific questions. It was mostly to deal with you know, those, those extra questions, you know, once you're done with the optometrist, they're going to have X, Y, Z questions yeah, about the yeah. lens and the follow-up or, or whatever else that may not have been initially addressed. So. Got it. And the optician um, and the staff will have the time to go through that, right? I think is that's the important thing is like we we want to be the, the optometrist to be the, the point of introduction for this treatment, um, but we don't necessarily have the time to sit there for 10 minutes to go through, you know, what the technology actually looks like. Uh, you mentioned the idea of having a champion. Do you think that would be, because we, we don't have that. We have this similar setup, although our mm -hmm. clinic is smaller and less staff here, but the opticians are all comfortable speaking of the lens. Yeah. Do you think it's valuable to have that one go-to person is like sort of the leader of the myopia management? Mm -hmm. It's a great concept, absolutely. And in chatting with other colleagues, as we all are starting to do more mm -hmm. regarding myopia management, it seems to be a common theme in clinics. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, just with our time constraints and, and larger staff, it has been challenging to implement uh, just a single person. And it's more of a, a, a team effort for yeah. sure. Yeah, I've, I've felt like, again, we're not as busy, but I felt like that for myopia management so far, yeah. um, it's worked better for us uh, to have multiple, like everybody's just trained. Yeah. Um, whereas for dry eye, we have 
one specific kind of point person. Yeah. I'm not sure what I have to probably, it's probably a pretty obvious answer, but I haven't really thought about why it's worked better. It's just naturally that's what's happened for yeah. us. So, um, yeah. There may be a day when it's like, you know what, we're busy enough. We need one person full time just running the, the myopia management side of things. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> it would be. The dream. <laughs> Uh, if you enjoy myopia management, yeah, it's kind of a dream, actually. It's not a bad idea. How do you, do you talk to them about, um, so as far as like expectations for visual outcomes, do you talk to the patient about what it's going to look like, adaptation? Gotcha. And then also, do you talk to the parent about what do we expect the numbers to look like or how much do we expect the progression to slow down? Do you mm -hmm. give them those types of details? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, depending on the treatment modality, there's different rates of adaptation. Uh, we found the contact lenses to be um, similar to the Hoya MyoSmart lenses as far as adaptation. Okay. We've almost had no issue across the board. Gotcha. Um, atropine, as you're probably more familiar with, you know, the half a dozen or dozen uh, children that we have on atropine, they did have to be brought down and the symptoms did need to be discussed. Oh, Okay. You know, the typical light sensitivity, low accommodation yep. was affecting them. So from that perspective, more time is probably spent with regard to atropine. Oh, interesting. Okay. Glasses and contacts are a familiar concept to most people. That's true. With regard to, you know, what's conveyed to the parents, we actually do have a form that we make the parent and the child sign as far as liability, uh, as well as, you know, no guarantee of outcome. Mm, I see. It is discussed that it's between 50 to 60%. That's, that's, you know, the target and, and most modalities, you know, have sort of proven in research that we should see that type of benefit. That's an interesting concept of having a signing a waiver to, to yeah. make sure that agreement is understood. Like there's no guarantee this is going yeah. to work on average. This is how it works. That's a yeah. good point. And actually probably yeah. something I think we'll want to in implement here. We find better buy-in uh, from the, the parents as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But it, it'll, it will prevent or hopefully save you from some of those parents who are kind of like, well, I thought you told me this was going to fix my kid's myopia. Well, no, you signed a little sheet of paper here yeah. in very plain language, right? Yeah. I think that's yeah. uh, maybe helpful. Yeah. Luckily, we haven't had too much pushback, uh, but that's, yeah. it's always good to document everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, also documenting like in the way that you have, I think, you know, with your presentation on what myopia is and how the lens works, showing that presentation to the parent, that's a form of documentation I think is really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you always have something standardized. So no matter who's dealing with the patient, they all have the same data that they're the things showcasing to the patient as well. That's, yeah. that's been beneficial in various ways. So you mentioned light sensitivity with atropine. That is very common. Yeah. Um, some kids will adapt to it. Some yeah. kids will complain about it consistently. Uh, but of course, when the pupil is going to be fixed or like dilated a little more than it should be, uh, light sensitivity is a common complaint. So when it comes to, now most of these kids who are on atropine will still require glasses or contact lenses, right? They're myopic. Yeah. So in that case, what are you doing to help um, uh, decrease that light sensitivity that children will likely face? So right from the initial discussions of prescribing atropine, the light sensitivity and the accommodation is addressed so there's no surprises. Right. So along with the atropine treatment, it's always recommended that we're, we're moving into anti-fatigues and the photochromics. I gotcha. As you mentioned. Both. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if they become light sensitive afterwards, then we have to redo the lens or something of that nature. We have had a couple of redos in that situation. So uh, right off the bat, you know, we attempt to recommend that photochromic. I, I think it just makes sense from a comfort standpoint as well as from a protective standpoint for that child. And as you said, they're already wearing glasses because the atropine's not refractively correcting their myopia. They still require those spectacles. Absolutely. So this is part of the conversation that I... Um, I wanted to actually get to anyways was the idea of sort of expanding our single vision mm -hmm. prescription uh, toolbox, repertoire, arsenal, Absolutely. right? So when we have a child and myopia management allows us to do that as well, kind of open up yeah. the, you know, the, the toolbox a little bit rather than simply just prescribing a single vision pair of glasses. Here's your minus three and your atropine prescription. See you later. You have the opportunity and we're not just doing this for the sake of just prescribing more expensive glasses. We are actually providing more advanced lens solutions to the patient that are going to help them. Yeah. I was actually leaning towards asking about photochromic, but you also mentioned anti-fatigue. I think that's a really valuable um, asset that we have and one that I prescribe as well. So mm -hmm. 
What's been the uh, uptake on the anti-fatigue? Any, any issues with adaptation on that, specifically with those kids who are in the atropine? With the myopia management, children who are being treated with atropine, it's been a very high uptake um, to the point of almost necessary, but highly beneficial, mm. fine line. Mm. Um, so with all of our atropine uh, children, we do prescribe anti-fatigues, as I mentioned, right off the bat. Maybe one or two of them didn't opt for them, and I think we had redos on those. Oh, interesting. So I would definitely recommend starting that conversation and just saying, here, this is, you know, yeah. part of the atropine and this is the solution. It's going to be like a normal pair of glasses. Your child won't really notice it. It will just benefit them. No, that's that's an excellent thing. And, and knowing that there may be some accommodative lag or issues there, we are basically covering our bases with that and kids are less likely to experience that. Yeah. Um, I want to get, we'll come back to photochromic in a second because that's going to be another important part of that conversation about mm -hmm improving or increasing the you know oppor opportunities to to offer these more advanced lenses to our single vision patients um let's stick with um anti-fatigue for a second let's talk about um non-atropine maybe not even myopia management patients mm -hmm. where else are you prescribing anti-fatigue and seeing value all over the place um we actually sell quite a few anti-fatigues i like their versatility the emerging price biope is, is the simple one. Mm. Um, however, the college student and the young professional have probably been number two as far as how many we have in anti-fatigues. Computer vision syndrome, uh, which can encompass a myriad of symptoms. Um, and then multiple younger teenagers and, and preteens as well for similar issues. Generally, it's going to be school issues. Mm seeing the board focusing back and forth, that headache that they develop and things of that nature. Right. So we do actually prescribe a high amount of anti-fatigues for various situations and we have been um, for years. Makes sense. It's yeah. actually been one of those that I found, uh, you know, one of those lens designs that I found to be super valuable. Versatile. Um, very versatile. Yeah. And and uh, there's a conversation I've started to have, I'm just gonna share this with you and, and hopefully somebody, maybe somebody out there will find it valuable. But um, when I'm speaking to like that, 20 something year old, you know, you know, no longer progressing, probably myopic patient mm -hmm. who's complaining about certain strains and things like that in their vision. Of course, our lifestyle is different now, right? We're not strictly looking far away. We're looking at our phone, computer screen, TV, driving, all these different things, yeah. sometimes all at once, <laughs> hopefully not phone and driving. You're not allowed to do that. Um, but we're doing all those things. Uh, and so what I tell patients is, okay, when I talk about glasses, I say there's three important factors when we're assessing the, you know, the quality of a pair of glasses. One is the prescription. Two is the coatings on the lens. Mm -hmm. And three is the design of the lens. Absolutely. And the, the, the design, so I say the third one is the one we don't talk about enough, right? Mm -hmm. We just say, here's your prescription, go get some anti-reflective, blue light blocking, so on, and we don't get to the third one. And so I, then I start to kind of go into what an anti-fatigue design is. Well, you're a popular guy. So I'll, I'll say that, that we don't talk about that third thing enough. I'll mm -hmm. go through what an anti-fatigue design looks like or yeah. whatever design we may be needing. And I found like the understanding and the uptake has has significantly changed mm -hmm. for the positive, mm -hmm. for the better, uh, by going through that little spiel. So anyways, I talk about that and I think that that's been really helpful in patients understanding the value of these more advanced lens designs. Yeah. So the other one that we were talking about and what I wanted to get back to was photochromic mm -hmm. and the value of prescribing that. Now you started by telling me uh, that you almost all your atropine patients will end up in a photochromic. That seems to me anyways, like a no brainer. I hope yeah. others out there listening and watching would feel the same way. Where else do you find the use of a photochromic valuable? How often would you say you're prescribing it even to non myopia management patients? We have a whole talk about sunglasses and the different options to a patient. And like you said, with the lens modality, each patient is going to have a different type of personality. Hmm. So we find that it works really well for the personality uh, of a person who wants everything all in one. Yeah. Um, those work very well in those situations. It's a do it all type of, of lens. Is it the same as a separate pair of prescription sunglasses? And that's usually the discussion that I have with right. them. The answer is, of course, no. Right. But it's probably the next best thing because it's always on. Absolutely. Which is a huge benefit. It's not search for it, look for it. It's already there. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. Now, bringing these two topics together a little bit, were you talking about myopia management? We're talking about photochromic. Something very exciting. Now, 
Gary and I are sitting here recording a couple of weeks prior to this going live, right? We're mid-May here, um, and this is likely going to go live early June. But before this goes live, there's an exciting new um, development that uh, we were talking about briefly, Gary. That is that the MyoSmart lens is coming out with a photochromic technology mm -hmm. in it. They call mm -hmm. it the Chameleon, uh, which I think is a cool name. Great name. Um, and it, from what I understand, I don't want to go too deep into this right now, but it's not an integrated uh, filter or you know uh, technology within the lens. It's a laminate over top, which helps to protect the uh, aesthetic, but also the, the actual um, MyoSmart DIMMS technology design in the lens. So mm -hmm. that's a super cool and exciting new thing that's coming up very, very soon. So when this is live, that technology will be available. Um, so please, if you're interested, go check that out. I know I'm going to be starting to prescribe that for pretty much all of my MyoSmart patients moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, especially given that it's summertime coming up uh, upon us now. But what are your thoughts on that uh, MyoSmart chameleon lens and, and how valuable you think it's going to be? I think it's a great option because up until now, I believe that um, we weren't able to prescribe both together. Right. It would have been, like I said, two separate pairs. So now we can actually match and, and marry that technology together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think children are um, huge benefactors of this photochromic technology, um, specifically now with myopia management. And, and I think it's going to work really well. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's going to be another one of those that's kind of an obvious choice um, for parents as well, mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, well, look, we can marry these two technologies together. Your kids kind of got everything they need all in one here. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to become one of those go-to options for us. Yeah. Um, perhaps even default and then give the regular MyoSmart as our second option, right? Mm -hmm. If the parent doesn't want mm -hmm. the photochromic on it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. One of the biggest hesitancies that many practitioners have when they're going into any specialty yeah. is price. Mm -hmm. Um, they're uncomfortable talking about price. Um, they're even uncomfortable setting the price around certain services. We're not sure how to. Um, I was wondering if you could share some thoughts. Let's talk about, first of all, the service side. Mm -hmm. A lot of these, you know, for doing myopia management, we're going to need to do some follow-ups. Mm -hmm. It might be only one or two follow-ups for some patients. It might end up being, if you do an ortho-K, 10 or 12 follow-ups. Mm -hmm. What are your, like... Any tips that you have or suggestions that you have for somebody out there who's trying to integrate myopia management or any specialty for that matter, getting kind of comfortable with figuring out pricing and offering a service for a price to the patient? Mm -hmm. Definitely a lot to unpack there, Harbier. Yeah. And our journey has definitely varied as far as what we initially offered and what we found kind of worked for us. The most important aspect is understanding the equipment that you're using, mm -hmm. the cost of that equipment understanding the cost of your staff's time as well as your chair time mm -hmm. and the optician's time. That's good point. With these more specialized services, there is a higher demand that the parents expect. So initially, we had gone through that analysis and I would encourage everybody to go through it or at least to start looking at that to have a better understanding uh, of what you're offering. Hmm. And if I could quickly mention that years ago before this was sort of a program, yeah. you know, we were doing it probably like many people, like you said, decades ago, we're doing it just as part of their regular, you know, right. exam services. So what that, um, the result of that is that we actually offered a myopia management program and attempted to convey the benefits and all the additional things that they were getting for a certain price. And probably for about a year and a half, um, you know, we had very low uptake at that point. So I would call that a global fee. Right. I remember you mentioning this now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a set fee that kind of was upfront. You pay, do you mind sharing roughly like what the number was? Was it a ballpark? Was it 500 or 1,000? Or... It was 595. Okay. And that included all the follow ups and testing and so on, but that was paid upfront. As a lump sum, it didn't include the ortho K. There was a separate fee for that. Sure. Uh, there's a lot more to that, as we've discussed previously, but that would include the original assessment, the cycloplegic refractions every six months, the axial length measurements, along with the topographies, uh, and I believe it was a more generous time allowance for the chair time as well, which gotcha. brought that price up. Got it. Yeah. And you're saying for you had that in place for a year, year and a half, but the uptake was low, mm -hmm. so you feel like that upfront global fee was not well received. 
Initially, no. So we had we switched to a more a la carte system, gotcha. and we have seen many more uh, children and parents actually, you know, getting involved now. Good. The, the barrier to entry was much lower. Not to say we're giving away the services; it adds up to similar, I would say. Um, but people just like paying as yeah. you go. Uh, that that sticker shock absolutely it's easier to swallow when you're yeah. doing oh, it's a hundred bucks and then a hundred bucks and then you know that's right or, or whatever i understand yeah. that makes sense and i've, yeah. I've heard colleagues talk about it both ways you know mm. they say yeah if we're doing atropine pay 500 bucks up front that's going to cover your you know or whatever the number might be yeah um and some people say they have great uptake but it, it yeah. depends on your clinic your the doctor yeah. the demographic all these things so so that's a that's great that's a great story thank you for sharing that because i think there's going to be others out there who are trying to figure out what's right for them mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to test it out yeah um other times you might know what your demographic is yeah. you know um and so that's great and for us um we are more now along the lines of what you're doing we have kind of a combined system so uh, or a mixed system so if somebody's doing a myosmart lens for example yeah. it's a premium lens we charge a premium price but with that we include follow-ups certain number of follow-ups yep. certainly a lot a certain amount of time yep. and so it's easy for us to kind of just wrap it all up and say well this pair of glasses this technology includes your follow-ups yep. atropine of course will be a different ball game um, and so we have to kind of explore what's going to work best for us absolutely uh, going back you mentioned um, going back a little bit to what you were saying earlier about the biometer axial length mm -hmm. Uh, I do want to quickly bring that back up again because in some cases it is vital, in other cases it may not be absolutely necessary. Yeah. What's your suggestion to someone who's earlier on um, just kind of dabbling? Let's say they want to start doing atropine or start selling a MyoSmart lens. Do you recommend they get it day one or do you think pick it up along the way? What's the your thoughts on that anyways? No right answer to how to approach it, but just get started doing something. Mm. Um, the initial, the last year and a half, that, that time period where we had our global fee, it was all about getting the conversation started. And I talked so much to parents about this new technology and I continue to do so. So mm -hmm. now parents are coming back, you know, a couple of years later for their annual examinations. Yeah. And they are, this is actually where a lot of our growth is from. So mm -hmm. I think that organic growth of just having that conversation is really right. important. So there's no, starting point okay i have a biometer i can start today uh, i love numbers and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting more of that data and that was why we invested in it to kind of spur us on to thinking about it and in, in, in pursuing that goal mm. but um our utilization has been lower with the biometer but i think it's uh, like you said with glaucoma there's a metric and i think that that objective data will be down the road very important especially as your myopia management practice grows absolutely agree with that yeah. the more data points we have the more we can more you can measure the more you can manage right yeah. uh i absolutely agree so we don't have an axial length machine yet but we are looking into buying one soon um and that's going to help us kind of track things more closely and, th and that's what a lot of this is about is tracking changes over yeah. time right so very good any other final words of wisdom that you would like to impart before we wrap up this conversation, whether it's myopia management or just expanding our single vision repertoire. Yeah. I would say get excited about it. This is a, a total shift in eye care. And it's something that, I, like I said, I talk about all day long. And I think the parents see that genuine enthusiasm for protecting their children's vision. So the excitement, I think, is infectious. Mm. Uh, the Optical benefits are present with the multiple pairs, uh, the anti-fatigues and these new technology lenses mm. being a little bit more premium. There's a there's benefits all around. That's what we call a win-win, Gary. That's a win-win. <laughs> I've heard of those. Yeah. <laughs> but look, it, it and I love that. Actually, that's a great place for us to, to end this. That the enthusiasm the, that you see from the parent in the exam room, it's awesome. It's cool to see parents. Mm -hmm eyes light up when you say, look, you remember when we were kids and, you know, this is all we had was just single vision glasses. Now, today, we have other options available to us that we can help slow down the progression and help treat the kids, treat your yeah. kids. Parents' eyes light up. They're so in, 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 uh, engaged, enthusiastic, and, and excited. Yeah. And I think if you start having that conversation, you'll see that. And like you said, it's infectious. It, you'll start to feel that encouragement yourself as a practitioner. So yeah. thanks so much, Gary. Man, I appreciate this. 
it's been a long time coming, dude. It, you know, we've been uh, friends for long enough. I'm glad that I could finally bring you on. I feel honored. Thank you very much for having me, Harbier. My pleasure. And thank you, everybody who's watching and listening. Uh, don't forget, you can get this on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your favorite podcast. This will be there. And uh, if you got some value from this, be sure to share this, whether you send a link to your friend, post it up on Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever. Thanks again for watching the uh, 2020 podcast, Canada's number one optometry podcast. I'll see you guys in the next episode.